to really trust in the process, trust in yourself, trust in the people around you and lean into that. Again, it it is a practice and it's counterintuitive. It's a complete 180 from the thinking of the world. Um, But then this is where life gets really meaningful and, and you see how powerful you are. You're, we're giving away so much power every day and we don't even realize it. We're subconsciously plugged into these societal standards we don't even believe in. So we have to consciously, deliberately, intentionally unplug and, and plug into this, which is our truth. And that's that's the full spirit too. It's our truth, our authentic power, rather than giving it away to, to all the nonsense. And, and we're all guilty of that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> we're human. Welcome back to another episode here on Mentory TV. You do know that my biggest goal is to get you or keep you as curious as I am. And this is why I created Mentory TV really as a sideline to my prime job, which is smart investing. But I think you know that already. Today, I have the big pleasure and honor to do a spiritual workout with you, (laughs) with you. And of course, Kate Ackman. Kate, thank you so much for joining us here on Mentory TV. I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, spiritual workout. Of course, before we get into the book you launched and which I thoroughly enjoyed, and I really didn't know where to start or to finish to ask you questions, and we only have one hour. So, <laughs> but uh, let me quickly introduce you, your persona to our mentor TV community. So, Kate Ackman, basically, what you did apart from writing this fabulous book, is you are Columbia University Certified Executive Leadership Coach. You you are on the basis of neuroscience and positive psychology. And of course, TV personality, we shared that one. We didn't share the modeling, (laughs) for sure not. We do share the entrepreneurship, that's for sure. So you're a very successful entrepreneur as well. And you're a meditation teacher. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. (laughs) It's great because, you know, I'm getting all these inputs and I do TM, Transcendental Meditation, for the past 10 years and talking about transformative uh, things you can do, introduce into your life. And apart from that, I don't know what you haven't done, but an absolute elite athlete, a swimmer. So your background, very eclectic, which I think gives you exactly that flavor and that richness that you are as a person and you also bring into the full spirit workout. Kate, welcome again. Oh, thank you so much. You know, I think it's a testament to, especially as women, I feel like our society wants to put us in a box and you can be one thing. And I'm sure you've experienced it. If you're more than one thing, some people are a little uncomfortable with that. So um, I I like at least when people read my background, I always have a little chuckle because I just look at myself as I I call myself the joy bringer. That's that's my job title. Um, But I think it's really important, especially as women, that we recognize that we are multifaceted, multidimensional, multi-hyphenate beings and to really own and embrace that. And it's okay to change your mind, change course and, and do various things, they all blend together and and nothing is wasted. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's one of the worst things one can say, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, of course. But on the other hand, we all have lived for a little bit and we do know what brings us further perhaps further than other people, is to be flexible, open-minded to see what is actually coming towards you rather than to kind of beat down a dead horse or dead horse. But let's start a little bit about the woman behind the book and uh, the the quick curriculum that I just uh, spelled out for our viewers. What made you become a leadership coach and why did that lead into writing The Full Spirit Workout? Yeah, I was, I had a very forward facing career on, on camera, like you mentioned, and I unfortunately and tragically lost two loved ones to suicide and it changed the whole trajectory of my life. It wasn't just the pain of, of losing these beautiful souls in, in such a shocking, tragic way, but it really made me examine or re-examine how I was choosing to live my life. Um, like most of uh, Yeah, almost everybody, I would say, placing all of my worth in the externals, you know, um, the money, how we look, all the shiny objects, social media following, things like that. And I find it a really unsustainable, unhealthy, um, unfulfilling way to live. And so 
I had no choice but to, to answer the call, the wake up call. And I, I went back to school and really wanted to study neuroscience and positive psychology and whole person coaching techniques. And I knew as an athlete how hard I had to train my physical muscles to compete at a high level. And I thought there must be a way to train our attitudinal muscles because sadly, the insanity and chaos, uncertainty and, and pure sickness of the world isn't going anywhere. So it really is up to us to get really confident, still steady fit and strong on the inside. And that was, I mean, I think the full spirit workout began back when I was a little kid. And I talk about that in the book. Um, but really in, in terms of an adult going back to school and just immersing myself in so much training and learning. Um, it's interesting that a couple of crises, deep crises, like losing beloved ones makes you consider life and purpose of life. And once you start thinking about, okay, what is death and what is life and what sort of place does it take within us living? Often, at least I feel, are we really just robotic? Are we just ticking boxes rather than really bringing joy, experiencing joy, what perhaps life should be about, and not in a hedonistic way, in the way of embracing. Yeah, I I have really had to redefine success, uh, coming from the modeling world, redefining beauty. And, and I was even got then into a category, the plus size modeling, which is anyone who's larger than a size six. And so then I'm, you know, modeling and, and getting approved for how I look to a certain degree, but then I'm big or I was, you know, still in my 30s, all through my 30s working as a model. So it's, I'm old. <laughs> quote, unquote. Um, so it, it's redefining that. And, and I have so many meetings with uber successful people who are my clients, multimillionaires, billionaires, the cream of the crop. And something that they all have in common is um, a lot of stress, um, lacking meaning, deep meaning in their lives, um, lacking in confidence of all things. And, and, and really searching for fulfillment that they're not really finding in all of this material success. And so um, I, I think it's important for all of us to really get clear on what success even is. And once we can define confidence and success and beauty, then we're on the right track and the fast track to really being able to leverage it and to embody it and own it rather than it being this pie in the sky you know, goal that we never find fully reach. Which is such an interesting angle, actually, Kate, because what you're saying and also mentioning more and more in your book, the self-confidence, self-talk, trying to be perfect, um, uh, you know, the power of words, visualizations, you go deep into that and you have also some interesting, you know, from the structure point of view, meditations, checking in. So you really work with us as readers. But what actually is happening here is that spiritual fitness is everything that is opposite to what we've been taught, what success is, how we are supposed to be, how we are supposed to behave. So or the entire socialization from day one when we are born, be a doctor, be a competitive swimmer, get the gold medal, always look immaculate, talk sense, all of a sudden, you know, there is never an underlying mother or father thought saying, yes, but, you know, it has to come from within. Uh, it, t tell us a little bit about that kind of discrepancy and how we can really find and make sense of that. Yeah, all the emphasis in our culture is on the externals, what we look like, how much money you're making, your numbers on social media, all of those things. And it's all about looking good and impressing others and and. For me, it was borrowing this idea of success from society. Um, but really, all the work happens from within. And we know that even with disease or a, a broken arm or something like that, you have to treat the root cause of the disease. You can't just put a Band-Aid on it. You can't just cover it up and hope it goes away. And so this is what I'm inviting people to do is, is taking that pause. That is the core of spiritual fitness is pausing, not forcing or controlling and striving to make anything happen but rather becoming the people who can actually achieve our cherished goals. And it really does start. It's so simple. It's not easy. Um, I even feel like I hear people saying like, oh, how adorable. I don't have time for that. When I talk to them about doing this sit and stare practice and I say, you know what I don't have time for? I don't have time to be overwhelmed or exhausted or 
speak unkindly to the people that I love or at the grocery store or the gym or anywhere that I go. I don't have time to, to be miserable and just go through the motions on the hamster wheel in the rat race. And so I think it, it's, again, asking yourself, who do you really want to be? And who are you underneath all of this stuff? Who is the real you? And what does the real you really want? And that takes quiet time, sitting alone by yourself, and reflecting and checking in with yourself. And I know that's scary and uncomfortable for a lot of people, but that's where life gets really juicy because you start to actually figure out who you are and and what you really want and then come up with a plan to get there. There is a lot of noise. Absolutely. There's the shoulds, the shouldn'ts and what have you. But I wonder, I don't know, you know, last weekend I went to a um, financial conference and I met my old colleagues from CNBC. They were there, they were doing the show on, on this, um, com- uh, on that conference. And I was asked, well, listen, so, you know, when you left, what did you miss? What did you, or what do you miss about being an anchor for CNBC? And I said, the only thing that I really don't miss, I miss you know, the privilege of talking to such intelligent, interesting people that have a real vision. And I always thought it was a privilege, but what I don't miss is having to be externally always immaculate. All right. Oh, he's like, oh my God, just let, let, let me be ugly and talk sense. Okay. And you have that kind of, either you make it an, a, an additional pressure, but of course you are in a visual medium, your visual medium that 99% is watched by men, financial TV, et cetera, et cetera. There is a lot of pressure on you. And I have to say that when I um, then left CNBC, I, you know, fell into this vacuum of who am I, if not the anchor, the face for CNBC, talking to all these people, them taking me seriously. Oh my God. I hope they did. But you see what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is that that constant pressure to always be on. And you're right. And then as women, um, there is the double standard. There's people, there's a lot of, and I say this with love, um, unattractive men on TV. I don't see nearly as many unattractive women. I don't see many women over a certain size on TV, things like that. And, and so I, I think even now, as I'm preparing to give a big keynote next week at this event, it's it's what you said, getting everything together, all the intellect, all the ideas to give this presentation. But then it's like, okay, and I got to get the hair done and the nails done and the facial and the this and the dry cleaning. And you're right, that pressure to look perfect too. But then when you, you look that part, then you get judged because it's like, oh, she's just this pretty face. Does she have anything intelligent to say? So again, we have people are going to judge for whatever. There's all of this going on. And it really has to be like all of that um, put to the side, the nonsense, I call it, block it out, be like sea biscuit, the thoroughbred racehorse, yeah. put the blinders on, run your own race. And, but it is for me, so much of my prep time is going within and even asking spirit, what do you want me to say to this group of people? Um, who, who is like the CNBC audience. And, um, you know, we come in as these charismatic blondes and something's like, Oh, these nice, fun girls. Um, what can we learn from them? And so really even asking, what does this audience want, want to hear? And, and having the courage, that's what the full spirit is. It's the courage to be not only that polished, put together person that we present to the world on camera, but that, that messy, flawed person behind the scenes, just trying to keep it all together, who has the loss of loved ones through tragedy or, or death, um, who has, you know, difficult relationships with look, everyone's going through all of this stuff. And I, I, as I say to my clients, this is a no pretend zone. I think the quicker we can just be real about who we are and where we are, it's our authenticity is so beautiful and relatable and lovable, but I don't see a lot of people embracing their real selves. It's everyone's putting on the performance, right? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think we we should, or uh, people try to move away from it where they become more open to vulnerability. I see, for example, if I post on LinkedIn to my community and I tell them, you know, the biggest mistakes I've made, or maybe I don't want to say regrets, but what I should have learned earlier where I was behind the curve. Oh my God, do I get a response? It's, it's almost as if I always call it like, you know, the phenomenon in a nightclub. First of all, there's nobody dancing on the dance floor. The first one goes in a room. We don't have space anymore. Anymore. But, you know, I wanted to ask you, looking at all those steps in, in your book, which one were or are your favorite ones? Because I have mm. my favorite ones. Oh, wow. I love that. You know, it, it's kind of like 
who's your favorite child? I, I love them all, but I just answer first thing that comes to mind. And I think of step seven, which is step up your spiritual yes. stamina. Give oh my gosh. Oh my I love seven. I was like seven and nine. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Because Let's I go. think for me, I, um, you know, I start off each step with a quote from um, people whom I admire. And <laughs> I start off that chapter with a quote from myself, which I even say, it, it feels funny to quote yourself, right? But it was this divine download that I got, you know, one afternoon after yet another huge rejection. And I was just throwing my hands in the air and looking up at God and my angels, like, what's up? You, you want me to do this project? You make it happen. I'm done. I don't even have time for this anyway. I mean, I was fed up. And I, I think a lot of us do that. We put in all this work. We don't see the result yet. And it's just, it's, it's, it can be infuriating. And so I was in that place of surrender and I heard those words, being okay if it happens and okay if it doesn't is a very powerful place to be. And I felt it not just intellectually, it wasn't just a cute thing to post on Instagram. It was, I felt it in my bones and my heart. And it was that moment of relief and complete surrender to, I don't care when this happens because I know that it will. And it, it is the divine timing. And, and the project I'm talking about in the rejection was this book that is now out in the world. Um, but there was some rejections along the way and it can be unsettling and it never feels good, but I'm, I'm so glad it happens on, on, on God's time rather than my time, because I finished my graduate degree. I got all these other certifications. The book is so much better because it didn't happen exactly when I wanted it to happen. And, and I do share that story in, in that chapter about the, the only reason that I'm alive. And it's, about my mother who couldn't get pregnant for eight years and eventually did. And I said, cause she always called us miracle children and we're all miracles. But I asked her, how were you able to get pregnant with all these circumstances stacked against you? And she said, I, I gave it up and meaning gave it up to a higher power. And so it is a practice like anything else. I think people again are like, Oh, I tried that once. It didn't work. I think, do you go to the gym once and think you're going to be fit? No. And so it is this commitment. It, it is the um, community and collaborating with your coaches, your colleagues, your friends, and, and really committing to this lifestyle um, of surrender. I, I feel like surrender is one of the biggest practices you can do to really call in absolutely anything that you desire. Absolutely. And it is so not liked by our society because surrendering is seen as giving up. And if you surrender, you're like, okay, you give her upper. How do you get people to say, no, no, surrender is allowing, is not, you know, it's a, it's a positive way of letting go and then just trust it happens. How do you, how do you get somebody to shift that real deep seated paradigm? Yeah, I think what just came up for me when you were talking is I think of relationships. Think if you meet this incredible dream partner and think if you're trying to force and control and call them all day and not leave them alone. We have to hang out and put your plans Friday. We have to hang out every day. You're going to repel that person so quickly and it's it's going to go away. We've all experienced that. I think we've all been on both sides in some way, shape or form. And so what do you do then? You You allow, you trust. I mean, the word confidence stems from the words to trust to do something with trust. So there has to be an element of trust and knowing that if this thing is not happening at this time, you are being sculpted and prepared. You're fine tuning your instrument before you can play it for the world. And to really trust in the process, trust in yourself, trust in the people around you and lean into that. Again, it, it is a practice and it's counterintuitive. It's a complete 180 from the thinking of the world. Um, but then this is where life gets really meaningful and, and you see how powerful you are. You're, we're giving away so much power every day and we don't even realize it. We're subconsciously plugged into these societal standards we don't even believe in. So we have to consciously, deliberately, intentionally unplug and, and plug into this, which is our truth. And that's, that's the full spirit too. It's our truth, our authentic power, rather than giving it away to, to all the nonsense. And, and we're all guilty of that, by the way, yeah. <laughs> we're human. <laughs> so it, it is just this That's why I, I wrote this book to give people the steps and the tools and the exercises like a physical fitness program. And we all know with physical fitness, it's something we have to do consistently. You don't go to the gym once a year and expect to be healthy.
No, absolutely. You have to continue doing it maybe more more than once a day. But, you know, what you were just saying, we have to trust, we have to believe. And all of these things, of course, boil down to self-confidence. And on the other side, what you dig into deep, which I like a lot, is these limiting self-beliefs and how, how they're created and how early they're created and how en passant often you are impacted. And then they tend to drive subconsciously decisions, behaviors all through our lives. Tell us a little bit about these self-beliefs because I believe, <laughs> commonly not self, I believe <laughs> that self-belief is one of the biggest, biggest um, obstacles we have to overcome because they drive subconsciously what we may or may not do. Yeah. And, and this is again, uncomfortable for people because I'm asking people to go back to childhood. That's where so many, if not all of our limiting beliefs really start. A caretaker, in my case, I, I talk about being four years old at the swim club and overhearing the swim instructor say to my mom that he didn't think I was a very good swimmer. And even as a four-year-old developing a mentality that says, oh my gosh, I need to perform at a really high level so that I'm safe in this world. And, and people will love me and approve of me and I'll feel worthy and valuable and equating that to having to do something to be loved. And I went about my whole life. And on one hand, it made me a very driven, ambitious person. I achieved a lot. Um, but at what cost? I was filled with anxiety, insecurity, self-doubt. And so I think everyone needs to go back and think of where did you even hear this limiting belief like I did? And then ask, is that even true? You know, who would I be without this thought? And then really invite, inviting in a new story or mantra for yourself. Or think of that compliment. We get compliments all the time and we kind of dismiss them. And we're like, oh no, but someone said that thing. And then we go about our lives collecting evidence for why that lie is true. Wonder why we feel like such crap. And in every human, underneath everybody's limiting belief, no matter how successful you are, there is that element of I'm not good enough because that has been communicated to us in some way. And that's what our culture bombards us with. Think of every face cream or anything that we've bought. It's because you're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're not talented enough. You're not this skinny enough. You're not curvy enough. You're not fit enough. You're not whatever. Um, so again, it, it is really going within and, and, and driving home. And that's why I put the affirmation to end each step because we're grounding in that I am and putting that into our body rather than all the luck out there that isn't even true. Yeah. And, and true. This is exactly what you were just saying, asking oneself that thought or that comment, is it even true? And I'm a big fan of Dr. J um, Daniel Amen. You know, he's got the Amen clinics uh, across the U S and he, that's one of his fundamental questions, whatever, you know, your automatic negative thoughts, question them. Is it even true? And this kind of question gives you the distance. You kind of like, you're, you're, you're getting a little bit, oh, okay, next to yourself rather than being in the midst in the whirlwind of your emotions and your negative thoughts. And negative thoughts are dominating, of course, also to protect us from, from uh, our ancestors' point of view. But again, you know, this not good enough. Again, we do have uh, Marisa Peer. She builds her empire on we are good enough and she does this hypnosis. She's, a, she's an amazing person as well. But I'm a a long year student of Kabbalah. And one of our fundamental thoughts uh, and beliefs in that sense is that we want to be better every single day. We want to expand. We want to come out of our comfort zone and kind of just give that little bit more, try that little bit more. And I wonder to, to what extent we can really balance feeling at peace and feeling, um, you know, that we are enough, but at the same time, trying to always give more, n not achieve more necessarily in the materialistic sense, but just become a better person. Yeah. I think the antidote to getting away from all of this ruminating, obsessing, I'm not good enough is to work on a project greater than you. For me, it, it was this book for me now putting together this keynote, which every time I do a keynote, I think, you know, you book the job and you're like, great. And then you start putting it together and workshopping it. I, I, I work with a coach and putting these stories together. And then I'm like, okay, and now things are in person. Some things are in person presenting in front of people and sharing these really uncomfortable stories. And you think, oh my gosh, 
why, why am I doing this? I even had a, a man that I was dating said, why do you do these speeches? There, there's so much stress and pressure. And I said, it's my life purpose and calling. And so I think when we are immersed in a passion project and doing something greater than ourselves for the betterment of others and the society, we don't care about the narcissist colleague at work being a jerk to us. We don't care. About, I mean, we may care, but it's just, we can't even be bothered because we're so locked in on I'm putting this project together to help people. I have struggled so much. I see everyone around me struggling. Here's what's helped me. Let me share it. I'm not telling you what to do. It's more of a, just thought you'd like to know, take it or leave it. But I do find when I'm, I'm, or I'm having conversations like this, all that other junk just falls away because I'm working on something so profound and I'm having a meaningful a conversation. I'm so present here with you. It doesn't matter what else is going on. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So spot on. And in, in a way, you know, you wrote the book and I started Mentory TV in the heights of the lockdown in, you know, in April 2020, because I wanted to know, I wanted to know what people think, feel, see, and I wanted to share it. This is why it's Mentor It TV, because there's so many incredible people out there like yourself and all the other guests that I had on the show and that I will have on the show that really have to share things. And is it interesting to to somebody, I mean, I was, I was uh, asked, Patricia, you don't have a niche. You know, you talk about everything from bio, you know, bioscience to microbiome to, to uh, Bitcoin, what have you. And I said, yes, because it's all part of my life. It's all part of life. So, and if it's interesting to you and you want to expand and get out of your comfort zone and you don't know anything about cryptocurrency, hey, you know, I spoke to a couple of people. It's a, you know, a pet project of mine. I love it. I'm a tech head, but at the same time, it's super spiritual. What does exclude the other? I can only be eclectic. Okay. So if you like it or not, same thing, Kate. But uh, let me just quickly ask you a couple of things. Comfort zone. Huh. And again, there we are in actually in step one. And I love mm -hmm. The question about comfort zone because uh, I always try to push mine. Oh, God, is it exhausting at times? I'm just like, oh, just, I just want to huddle up and be with whatever. Um, so on page 14, T. Harv uh, Eker, is it Eker or Eker? I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever died of discomfort, yet living in the name of comfort has killed more ideas, more opportunities, more actions, and more growth than everything else combined. What a fantastic quote, um, simply because I find it very, very true. So is pushing for our limits the actual purpose of life? Wow, what a question. I, I just know that nothing great or profound or something um, that's going to expand and grow you into the person who can achieve the goals and, and, and help you do the things that you say you want to do it doesn't happen when, when we're comfy. It, I love being comfy under my blanket, watching my movie. Um, but we need to step out of that and, and not just for ourselves, but when we do that, I find in my experience, the universe really steps in to co-create with us and um, give us gifts. For instance, I even talk about um, the stress of, of leaving my home and in Los Angeles and moving to Chicago and you know, I, I really didn't want to do it. I took a leap of faith. Um, I, I was called to do it, but it, it, I was sad to leave. But then I sold my house at the, to this day, the height of the U.S. real estate market. And so, um, and went into journalism, which as you know, does not pay well starting out. And, and I went back to school and it was very expensive, but I had the sell of my home I made a lot of money on my home to help me with these things and really start my, my journalism career. So I, I do find that, or for me, I talk about living in Africa and not the rich American fancy safari, but living in the bush with the African people, no air conditioning, it's dirty, you're sweaty, no Wi-Fi, um, which coming from America is, is a little disruptive. No, absolutely. And no alternative milk, no oat milk, no soya milk, no whatever, you know, non-dairy, non... Well, where is our comfort? <laughs> yeah. I, I, or people went out and like killed an animal and I don't eat meat. And that was dinner. And I just, yeah. it was, it was, re it was really challenging, but, um, and I was there working as a journalist, but again, it just, it gave me such a greater appreciation for our lives and the things that we so take for granted. I mean, electricity, Wi-Fi, air conditioning, things like that. And so I just, whatever your comfort zone is big or small, maybe it's just, um, having a conversation with somebody at work that you normally don't talk to and you might learn something about that person and, or be able to um, help them. Maybe they're going through the loss of a loved one. I, I think it's just 
being willing. That's my favorite spiritual principle is our willingness. You know, our good intentions are not enough. Our willingness is everything. Just be willing. However, that is, um, maybe it's having that, um, you know, difficult conversation with your child. Um, maybe it's leaving the unhealthy relationship. Maybe it's leaving the job that's unfulfilling and starting your own business and taking baby steps, knowing and trusting confidence, trusting that the right people and opportunities and experiences will make their way to you when you take this leap of faith. Yeah. And I think the question here is about the trigger. Okay. One thing is to actually do the leap of faith, but what actually triggered you? And in uh, in your book, you talk about signs, reading signs, reading omens. Now you talk to any, I don't want to be discriminatory, but you talk to anybody most of the time, non-female <laughs> about, you know, reading the signs and going omens, blah, 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 blah. Um, they go like, sure, darling, just, it's, it's fine. I've got lots of signs and then my indicators of my Porsche or Ferrari and whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, but how do you, how do you, even if you're the most open person, a see something as being the sign and have that then lead you to a certain emotion, thought, and then action. How do you really pick up on those signs? What, what is the mindset? I think for me, the first sign is just that, that discomfort. I think it's that first we need to be self-aware. And if you're Googling about some red flags or you're Googling about this, it, it's probably a good sign. You need to leave that relationship, that job, that city, that, that whatever. Um, and so I think for me, it was just, I'm really committed to uh, personal growth development and, and I want to enjoy my life and feel good. I, Fortunately, never bought into that mentality that, you know, this is suffering or life is suffering and work is pain and you should be miserable. And so I, I really think it's, um, or what's another one that you often hear, um, you work, oh, I never became desensitized when I worked in TV news. And for me, I, I, this is something I find myself saying to people a lot, um, you know, or like after 9-11, that anniversary, it's just, you think, um, wow, that's really depressing. It's appropriate that we're depressed. I mean, I would see horrific things covering the news and I don't want to be desensitized. I'm watching children being killed. That is so upsetting. And I don't, I don't want to feel any other way, but upset. So I think again, um, I think you can also look for signs. You can ask for them, you know, show me a sign. Even one day I was, I was just feeling, I, I see them. I live in New York city. I will walk around. I, I, <laughs> I was in a neighborhood I'm never in last week and I was feeling a certain way and I walked down the street and there was this massive sign that said, you are not alone. And sometimes we just need mm. those reminders, but, but being open to it. I also talk about my pennies from heaven that my deceased loved ones, you know, if I'm having that moment, I look down and first of all, seeing a penny, which is one, it's oneness, it's, it's value, it's money, it's just reminding us. So I think the more that we can just be open and, and not succumb again to societal standards we don't believe in. You have to be at this job 10 years before you can do this. All these things that you always hear, um, again, asking yourself, is that true? But I really encourage and invite everyone to make their own rules and, and come up with their own tools for a better way of living. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a good way of living is, I don't know if you follow Sadhguru, but I love Sadhguru. I mean, there's almost, I don't know, 10 million followers, 9.7 to be precise. And, you know, for him, the purpose of life is actually joy. And, uh, and I love his philosophy, which really many years ago opened my eyes also to, towards what we can influence and what we cannot influence. And there, Kate, your, your um, expression of you have to kind of let go of certain things you can't influence, but what you can influence is your thought, your emotion, and what is happening to your body. The rest is really quite neg negligible, but with your behavior, with your thoughts, with the energy you bring, um, you can influence not only you, but also to a certain extent, the um, the environment. You mentioned relationships. Let's get into relationships and love. Okay, it is awful to lose a couple of loved ones, especially the way you did that nobody knew. Nobody would have imagined. So this perfect uh, kind of screen that uh, was reflected to the friends, to yourself, was a bit of a shock. But in terms of relationships, you know, where does where does the spiritual workout have to really filter in when it comes to love and continuing to live a good relationship for a long time? 
Yeah, this even what you just said when you talked about the purpose of life as you were talking, and this this leads into relationships. For me, what came up is is to help other people and to be of service to other people. I think our lives become a lot more successful and fun and happy and meaningful and fulfilling when we are not just focused on ourselves and, and focusing on what we can get, rather focusing on what we can give. So again, the purpose, you want to have a successful relationship, friendship, professional, marriage, with children, whatever it is, let's focus on what we can give rather than what we can get. There's this, this neuroses um, and an almost narcissism of, well, is this person really good enough for me? And, and I like to say, am I, am I really showing up for this person so I can be my best self and creating the space for them to be the most enlightened version of, the, of themselves? Huge difference. Instead of making that laundry list of, and you could even be married right now, but you still have your laundry list. And it's like this, oh, they're not checking off this, 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 and this. They may not be right for me. Divorce, I'm out of here. And maybe sometimes the solution is the relationship has run its course. But I think the more that we can prepare ourselves for the, the kind of love and experience that we crave, but also that our current or future partner deserves. And, and spending that time and energy, as I like to say, we do our best work in relationships when we're not in one. <laughs> when you're, yeah. you're taking the time so to true. work on yourself rather than just projecting mm -hmm. or expecting someone to fill some void within us. We've all been there, right? Hopefully we were in our 20s and we've grown out of that. But I see it all around me. And you see even... Um, you know, people, oh, well, I look a certain way when I'm with this person or they do this for me. So I don't have to do this for me. And I think, as I like to say, I am a complete person who wants to share my completeness with another complete person. That's absolutely. So one plus one makes actually three. And I'm not talking about babies here. So no, I think, <laughs> no, no, no. It, I, I think it's so true. And you know, um, one of your lines, which are, touched me and reminded me of an encounter I had, I was about 20 so <laughs> decades ago, is, is when you said, okay, you have your laundry list Fair enough. You do know what you would like and uh, you think you're compatible with in a person. But just have a look at yourself, what you actually can deliver and what the person that you are aiming for would find you attractive as a person, as a complete person inside out, okay? And then perspectives change and maybe also the feeling about you is like, oh, I'm expecting, expecting. And that brings me to that experience I had um, where a beautiful beautiful guy um, wooing me. And I said, no, <laughs> I said, no, you know, it's just not really, we're friends. It's not going to work. And, you know, blah, blah. and he said, I want to tell you one thing. You can only expect what you can give yourself, you know? If you're looking for a better one than me, I'm like, oh my god, am I that bad? You know, I mean, oh, that wow. was, yeah. And and in a way, it, it and that line in your book reminded me of of that particular encounter, and it stuck with me for a long time. Where I thought, um, is he right or is he not right? But I think there is some truth to it. You know, before you start expecting, expecting, and wanting, wanting, first of all, see what you can bring to the equation. See, first of all, what, you know, what, what sort of culture, uh, atmosphere, energy you would like to have and bring that in. And then potentially, you know, you, you find the other one being compatible there by itself. Yeah. And, and I think with any, I mean, I love animals and dogs more than anyone. I'm obsessed with my parents' dog, my brother's dog. They both have the mini golden doodles. They are the loves of my life. I'm in, in love with them. I want to get a dog so bad. I, I, I don't have a dog because of my lifestyle. I'm traveling. I divide my time between two places. I'm all over the place and it. It wouldn't be fair to the dog. Could I do it? Yes. I think this, this, we do the same thing with relationships where it's, I, okay, I'm busy with this. Or I'm obsessed with my career. I've got this going on. I've got 50% to give for me. I, if I don't have all of myself to give, then I would rather not be in a relationship. I don't do anything halfway. And, and so I, I kind of wish more people would adopt that or even there's one celebrity in particular I think of, I don't think she's been single for one day in her life. I mean, she like gets out of a relationship and she's with the next person, I think the next day. And, you know, I, I just, we need to know how to be, be by ourselves too. Even if you are in relationship to be able to say, okay, I'm going to go away on this retreat this weekend by myself and do some personal development or 
even that five minutes a day. I, my One of my favorite quotes ever is by Blaise Pascal that says, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability, inability to sit quietly in a room alone. I think so many of us are, are scared of ourselves. We're scared of what we may discover when we quote unquote go there. And, but this, this is really, you want to have, you want to make more money. You want to be more successful in the material world. You want to have better relationships, sit quietly in a room alone by yourself every day. I can hear people saying, Oh, well, you don't have kids and you don't have this. It, it's, it's again, that conscious choice to have someone watch for five minutes, have the kid. I mean, there are always ways to do these things. And so, as I like to say, we can, we can make excuses or we can find a way to, to really live the life that that's going to light us up. Yeah. So spot on. It is true. It's not easy to find, especially when you are in uh, doing transcendental meditation, you should do it twice a day for 20 minutes and cutting out out of a busy life. Kids, no kids. It doesn't matter. Even if you don't have children, you still fill up your life with what things to do. So you really have to schedule time for yourself, but you think, oh, that's so selfish, but it's not because the way uh, you are impacted, but whatever you do by whatever you do for yourself or within yourself impacts and resonates with whatever you do outside so there is like that that proverbial stone you drop into into the lake and then all of a sudden it does have that ripple pack, uh, effect and it really is powerful the other thing what you were saying just sit by yourself be still and all of a sudden things come again society sees often stillness as stagnation kate and it's not what I say to that is go slow to go fast. And even one of my instructors at Columbia in the coaching program said this to me, even when working with a client, not just jumping in, let's say you come a topic and you say, you know, um, I need to, my direct reports aren't getting along. We all need to come together. We need to communicate better. If we go right to, okay, let's get right to the solution. It, you may get it and it may work for a day or two or a week, but it's not going to bring lasting change. All of the motivation for change happens in the who and the why. Why is this goal even important to you? And so with you as a client, I would spend a lot of time in your developmental frames, your worldview. Why do you think the way you think? Same with sitting quietly, same with meditation. As you know, when you take that time, whether it's 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes to go within, to call in. What should, what should I say to this person today? I'm going to have to talk to my boss. What should I say? Invite in guidance. Again, we're going slow to go fast. I find when I take these breaks, I come back, I achieve 10 times more and half the time I'm more um, creative. Uh, my performance skyrockets. So go slow to go fast. And, and, you know, it's really, really powerful to ask these questions before you go to bed. It's something really strange. And unless you tried it um, and you see it actually works when you have a profound issue, you want to, you want to solve and you just don't know, you just don't know. Yeah. And you're going around in circles, ask that questions, that, that particular question, very specific before going to bed and something happens overnight Either it's the brain working or the brain finally working with the guts, uh, et cetera. But it seems to all come together. And at some point, the answer is there. And um, that is, is something that I wanted to ask you about, about your clients. You said earlier on, you know, the commonality there is stress, lack of confidence, but potentially also fear. Um, do big CEOs come to you? Uh, or, they, or do they just function as long as they can and only at the point of breakdown might get a nudge? Or do you have to approach them to pinpoint, hey, you could actually improve if you looked at things differently? I think I think a lot of people are, are more open to coaching now. They really see it as a, a place where their talent merits investment. I think in the past, it's like, why? Do, same with therapy. Like, why do I need a coach? Why do I need a therapist? And, and I think I have an athletic background. So think of your favorite athlete. I think of Tom Brady. We were both Big Ten athletes at the same time. He's still winning Super Bowls. And my knees hurt when I go to Pilates. So I bow down to you, Tom Brady. Um, mm. But it's because he practices harder than anyone. Not because he's the worst, but because he's the best. That man has more coaches than anyone. He doesn't pretend he can go it alone. Even his wife, he's credited with helping him. She's really into mindfulness and meditation, slowing him down to go slow, to go fast. So he's really incorporated this huge team to help them. And I think to help him, I think CEOs who, who know that they're struggling, uh, 
if they're lucky, their company or organization is experiencing huge growth, which a lot of people did quite well last year when a lot were struggling and suffering. And so they're seeing, we're not going to be able to sustain this unless we do get help, unless we do get coaching, unless we can come up with some strategies, unless, you know, the C-suite executives um, have someone like me where they can just be themselves, talk openly about what's happening. I, you know, something that I think is an epidemic in our culture, both personally and professionally, is that people aren't feeling seen or heard or acknowledged. And I think especially, you know, people have this misconception with coaching. I'm going to come in and solve all your problems in an hour. And, and that's not what coaching is. And, and it really, you need to change and transform. So th and then you get the lasting results. But I find so much when people feel seen and heard and acknowledged and not judged, and they're able to be real, massive transfer, uh, transformation and, and growth occurs. And so I think this is a gift that we can offer our, our loved ones to outside of the office and um, not be so dismissive in the name of I'm busy, I'm stressed, I don't have time, really being more present with people, even just for five minutes. Like if you come to me instead of just saying, oh, that sucks, have a good day. Hey, how are you? How are you doing? Um, or what else do people like to say to us? Oh, just let it go. I find that so dismissive. And I think I'd love to let it go. How, how, how should I go about doing that? So I think just giving people that space and there's an acronym called wait that I learned in the coaching world. And it's, why am I talking? Just being quiet for a minute. I, when I started my, my coaching program, and as you know, this as, as a TV presenter, our value isn't talking. And you know, especially on TV, time is money. You got to keep keep it going. No quiet time uh, in between. You know? So if your your guest isn't talking much, you, you better fill in. You know this. Yep. Um, and coaching and, and relationships, our power is in listening. I absolutely agree. And leaders listen, this is what I always say. But uh, with regards to coaching, there's this fabulous book. Um, I'm sure you've heard about it. It's called Outliers. Why, why people are just so extraordinary. What makes Bill Gates, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is actually the opportunity and the practice, the coaching, et cetera. So coaching is good. It shows self-development, be it on an emotional, psychological, physiological basis, it doesn't matter. It's still the person. It is, you know, the holistic approach to ourselves. And I agree with you that today's society is a lot more forgiving if you have an emotional coach. It doesn't mean uh, you are mad and all of a sudden you need to shrink or you're kind of like, okay, somebody to take, you know, distance from. But something is, you just said, um, I would like to drill into a little bit. People want to feel seen, heard, understood, yet not judged. How come that this pressure of me, 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 you know, we are also seeing on the social media is really is really not being satisfied with the social media because we can all be reporters now, have our own, our own show, you know, Mentory TV. I'm not on CNBC, but I'm on Mentory TV. Hey, you know what I mean? So, and, and we have the technology to be seen, to be heard, but at the same time, we still don't feel satisfied in being seen or heard. Why? Yeah, I think because we, again, it's, are we self-focused or other focused? When you're immersed in, I'm doing this show because I want to help people. I, let's say your goals, I want 10 million people to know about transcendental meditation and Bitcoin and spiritual fitness. And then how am I going to do that? What can I do to do that? Rather than I want to make $10 million and I want a, a million downloads and I want this celebrity to find me and be on my show. And all those are fine. And even, you know, you just talked about Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, extraordinary um, material world accomplishments, right? When I think of those two men, I think of divorce and unhappy marriages. And so in my mind, they aren't the definition of success. There's a level of it. So again, I'm talking about full, full body, full picture success, um, because with anything, What's the cost? Just like me with the swimming and the obsession with performance. Achieved a lot, but at what cost? And so I think ask yourself, okay, I want to do this social. I need a million likes on this photo. Why? Maybe what you need is to turn off the phone and, and, and spend some time in going within and, and liking yourself more so you don't need so many likes. That's been my rub with social media. I get on and I've gotten to a place I'm like, 
I, I don't need the validation. So I kind of don't even want to be on. I get on and it, it seems a little toxic. So for me, I still need to be on there and connect for my business. Um, and so I am, my intention is to connect. My intention is engagement. So every person who comments, I, you take the time to comment, I'm going to write you back. And people are always like, wow, thanks for writing back. You send me a message. I'm going to respond to you at some point, maybe not immediately, but I think an offering content that is going to uplift and, and educate rather than look at me, here's what I'm doing. Does that make sense? Uh, totally. And you know, people know it. People know whether you're in for it uh, for yourself or for them. They feel it. I don't know whether it even transmits as, as energy, but I think it's, it gets very transparent if this is just a me, me, me show or it's all about you and I'm putting the platform out there and trying to uplift you, make you better, but really for you, not because I'm Mama Teresa and I want to be heard or seen or liked or loved for that. Or even, you know, I had a moment, I'll just be totally candid. I have these moments quite frequently because I'll watch, there's one show that I watch, <laughs> I get, I'll just like the, like the Bachelor franchise and I will watch some girl who was on The Bachelor making hand over fist money from Instagram, buy this face steamer, or I'm wearing this athletic clothes, you know, the sponsors. And I think, oh my gosh, some 22 year old who has never worked a day in her life is like buying a $2 million house or to be half naked on Instagram. And I just, it, and I have those moments and I have to quickly pull myself out of that and, and say, bless her. And she's on her journey. And I take nothing away from her. Go, go get your money, girl. But, um, I come back to your, I'm here for a different person, a, a purpose, and I'm here to make an impact in a different way. And I love beauty products as much as the next person. I've sold them on QVC globally for years. Um, but I do have a bigger purpose. And I, I find that when some of those types of jobs or the modeling jobs like go away, I, I and you know, you feel rejected, but I know I have a greater purpose. And, and a lot of times it do doesn't feel sexy. A lot of times I work extremely hard. And don't make any money, um, but it's all part of it. And it goes back to trusting the process. And I don't need, and again, I have a client who says, I don't need to close another hundred million dollar deal. I don't need more money. I don't need another house or car or whatever. And he who had a heart attack, you know, in his 40s says, he's thinking about legacy. What do I want to be remembered by? Someone who just closed a bunch of business deals. What do I want my children? And so now he's thinking about, legacy rather than just the accumulation of more stuff and money. So I, I really, I, I love money. I love nice things, but I, I, I really do want to invite people to think on a bigger picture um, because I think I, I, I am proof of that. I, I got the thing and I, we've all done this too. You get the thing and then it's like, you want the next thing and the next thing. And as you know, you, it needs to be bigger and better and you're, or you're not satisfied. And that's even, you know, our brain gets used to stuff. So That's why we need to have more internal goals because the external is never going to fully satisfy, satisfy us and especially not longer for 20 minutes, sadly. No. No, absolutely. And you know, the self-satisfaction is hardly ever gained from outside. It comes from the inside and the way you you perceive it or you you keep it. And I think you're spot on. But listen, we have to wrap up this fantastic conversation, Kate. I, I could have I could continue for hours, but the last one, what do you think if you think about the full spirit workout, um, are the three key things you want all of us, our community to take away with? If you say, hey, if you don't have time to go through the entire book, but these key three, three things, um, keep those in mind. They're really, they really important. I think to remember how powerful you are and that you can do whatever you decide is important enough. I think the power of taking a pause and, and just being a freaking person, as my speaking coach says, and, and really knowing that confidence is an inside job. It starts with trusting and then being present, patient, having a purpose greater than yourself, being prepared, practicing. And I think asking yourself, what if, if you get stuck and say, oh, this is so hard, just do a reframe and say, what if this isn't hard? What if this is easy? What if this is a perfect opportunity to reach out to Patricia and collaborate and shift out of that, get into possibilities rather than staying stuck, but just know that it's all about becoming the person who can attract your goals rather than striving, forcing, controlling. 
Absolutely beautiful. Okay, thank you so, so much. Awesome. Congratulations on you as a person, 360 degrees person. This is what I like. I love, you know, there's not that many around, I have to say. Congratulations to the book. I thought it was it was fabulous, Reese. But not only putting things again clear, um, but, you know, making it also a tool because you're an expert, uh, you know, a, a professional coach and a meditation teacher. So people can use this book as a tool. And as you were just saying, when you feel stuck, get the tool, pull it out, remember, and do your workout as often as you can. Daily would be best, so we are on the top of our game, but for sure, integrating it into a sort of lifestyle is a good idea. Thank you so much, Kate. Yeah. And thank you, my dear Mentory TV community. I hope you did enjoy our fantastic conversation. Well, I did with Kate Atwin. And, uh, you know, there is so much wisdom put in a practical way in the parallels between, you know, your physical strength actually is generated from your internal strength is, I think, the key theme. And then the rest about, you know, being feeling abundant and love and really uh, in, <laughs> just in, in closing everything and everybody that is around you in a positive way is really what changes than the outside anyway. So thanks very much. And I'll see you soon here on Mentory TV. Bye.